Hi, welcome to my KubeCon talk. My name is Dan Garfield. I'm going to be talking about the quest for the ultimate Kubernetes home lab and ultimate slight caveat. We're going to try to do it as cheap as possible. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about the goal of what we're what I'm trying to what I was trying to build. Um, we'll go through the build and of course we'll talk about what's next, what I'd like to do next. And hopefully at the end we'll have some time for some questions. So uh, my name is Dan Garfield. I'm the chief technology evangelist for CodeFresh. Uh, but this is more of a hobby talk, talking about something I built in my house. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at TodayWasAwesome. Uh, just remember how you felt about the day, and if it was awesome, then today was awesome. Easy. Uh, I'm a member of the Forbes Technology Council, as well as a Google developer expert. Uh, and so I like to talk about Kubernetes, I like to talk about DevOps, I like to talk about cloud. And today I'm going to be talking about HomeLab, which is actually Kubernetes bare metal at your house. Um, I love doing these at-home projects. I love Raspberry Pis, love uh, home labs. I built a Raspberry Pi chicken coop, uh, powered chicken coop a few years ago, which of course had an, a linear actuator that opened and closed automatically based on the time of the day, which was a lot of fun. A Cody game box, you know, all of the standard stuff that you see people do with Pis. So I love doing that kind of stuff. I love having something at my house that uh, actually provides a lot of value. Love flexing those tech muscles at home. And that's what I try to do here. So my first goal with my Kubernetes home lab is I basically want to run the services for my house. And that means that I need to be able to run x86. Now, when I say run real workloads, this isn't meant as a dig at all to ARM. I love ARM, great architecture. Of course, it's on my phone. Of course, I've got a lot of these Raspberry Pi powered stuff. But the truth is that a lot of the workloads that I work with every day and most cloud workloads happen to run on x86. That may change. You know, Apple's coming out with that, uh, their ARM-based chips for their laptops, and that might force a, a, a change in how people are developing software. But in the meantime, I need to be able to run some x86 stuff, which is going to be a, a pretty big limiting factor on what I can choose to build my cluster out of. My second goal was to... Oh. My second goal is that I need to reduce toil. And uh, the truth is that I'm the only person that can work on this. So I can't have something that's really complex and difficult to manage. I can't have something that's breaking all the time because I frankly don't have time. I've got three kids. I don't have time to go be chasing around broken down servers. And I've run you know, nice servers in the past at home and I end up recompiling kernels and fixing storage pools and it's just not something I want to spend my time on. I need to have something that is fairly automated. I can invest a lot of upfront time to get rid of any long-term uh, toil. So we're going to be using those principles as well. I also wanted to have something that was multi-node. Now, why do I want multi-node? Well, one of the things that I noticed about working with Docker Desktop or even a Kind Cluster is I don't really get the sense of how workloads perform over time nor how they react when a node failure happens or they migrate or I'm trying to scale it up. You just can't really simulate those things very well. And so having a, a, a cluster with a couple of nodes gives me the chance to see how different pods perform when they, when they move, when they maybe migrate, if they, get, if they get evicted or that kind of thing. Um, and it really just changes the way you think about uh, Kubernetes a little bit when you're using it on your home cluster. Now, when you're using it in production, you can invest a lot of time to make sure that everything runs perfectly and smoothly. But, uh, you know, this is a hobby project. So I, I do want to have multi-node. I do want to have scale. And I also want to have something that's modular. So if I'm running a lot of services and I can't, you know, I don't have enough room for something else, I don't want to replace my entire stack. I want to be able to, like, maybe just grab a cheap node and throw it into the pool and call it a day. I think that would be really cool. Um, number four, I want to be able to support stateful services. And, uh, you know, if I want to, this is a home lab, right? So I'm going to be running Plex, I'm going to be running maybe Home Assistant or Minecraft server or something like that. All of those services require stateful, uh, they're all stateful applications. They all require me to maintain persistent volumes. And so that's going to be uh, super important for, me, for us to solve in this build or for me to solve. Um, and finally, I want to be able to support hardware transcoding. That means I want GPU access for all my nodes. And if I, if I throw a pod up that's going to be transcoding a video file or something like that, I want to be able to take advantage of the GPU to do that so that I can actually um, you know, have it perform quickly. And of course, this is important too. Since I'm doing it on the cheap, that means that I have to be really careful with, uh, with my choices here. And that, of course, is the final requirement, is that this whole thing needs to be cheap. I can't break the bank on this. Anybody could go and spend $10,000, buy a bunch of high-performance nodes, throw them in a rack, 
and expect it to run pretty well. Um, not an option for me, and uh, it's also a hobby project, so I want to be able to, uh, you know, throw a note away if I if I uh, mess it up or something. Um, I don't want it to be too costly, uh, both in terms of my time and in terms of the resources that I expend, and of course the power usage. You know, I like many of you mined some Bitcoin back in the day, uh, and of course anybody that does that realizes very quickly that power consumption is costly, and in this case, I don't want to be paying out the nose for power consumption on this server. Uh, because at that point, it's like, well, I may as well just, you know, throw a cloud service up. Um, but of course, then I'm not getting the on-prem, like the, the bare metal experience that I'm looking for. Uh, oops. So, um, oops. So that means that uh, there are a couple of things that aren't options. The Raspberry Pi, as great as it is, as much as I love it, it's not an option. They have this really kick-ass Turing uh, Pi board that you can put seven compute modules onto. It's got 28 cores, super cool onboard networking. They're sold out everywhere. Really cool, cool board. I remember when it came out, I really wanted one, but it doesn't actually meet any of the criteria, all the criteria that I put out. Um, likewise, the uh, Ryzen Threadripper, you could buy that thing and you could have you know, maybe 64 cores to throw at Kubernetes. How cool would that be? But of course, this is pricey, pricey. We're talking, uh, I think it's over like 1500 bucks. But for the 64 core version, I think it's more like $3,000. So this is a pricey uh, CPU. And of course, you also have to build a whole machine around it. So, uh, and it's also not scalable, right? So this one, uh, unfortunately, isn't going to be the fit. Now, what is going to be the fit is the Atomic Pi. And this thing is a little known board. It's kind of a gem. Um, they're only $35 for one of these boards. And they have an Intel Atom processor with four cores. They have come with two gigs of RAM. They have 16 gigs of eMMC memory. Um, and they only draw max about three amps of power, usually less. So we're talking about something that's usually drawing uh, quite a bit less power than, um, than you know, anything standard that you'd be looking at. Very similar to Raspberry Pi. A little bit more power consumption than a Raspberry Pi, I think. But basically another you know, five volt kind of, kind of setup. This thing is sweet and, and we can even do hardware transcoding on it, which is really cool. So uh, they are chonky. They are, they are bigger than a Raspberry Pi, which you'll see in a minute. But um, people have built some really cool stuff with these. This, this build way over to my, my side here uh, is actually, I think it's 32 nodes. And so they have 32 times four cores to handle um, all of the different jobs they have. And they actually put up benchmarks that show that they were actually able to complete their workloads faster than a Ryzen 9, uh, which they spent, uh, you know, 750 bucks on all these nodes. Um, and uh, they have something that performs as well as maybe a $750 and $800 processor, which of course then requires a whole other system built on top of it. So they were able to cut, you know, 30, 40% of the cost off of this thing. Plus it's modular, plus you can add components. Um, there's also some cool stuff on the Thingiverse you can grab. And this one right behind me is actually a uh, server rack that someone has put, I think, 24 nodes into and they've stuffed it into their rack so they can I don't know what they're doing with it, running builds or whatever, but there is actually a pretty cool community around these boards. Uh, they're, not, they're not nearly as popular as the Raspberry Pi um, for a couple of reasons. You do have to manage the power on board, unlike a Raspberry Pi where you just you know, plug in a USB. You basically just have pins and you gotta use some, uh, some DuPont you know, wires to actually wire it up to a power supply. You have to buy a separate power supply. Um, and I didn't know these, you know, these server power supplies, you actually have to like tune, so you have to get out a screwdriver and like a voltmeter to actually get them to the right voltage. Sounds a little intense, <laughs> but once, once you do it, it's not that hard. Once you try it once, it's, it's fairly easy, so you can do it. Um, now they do, like I mentioned, they do support hardware transcoding. There is a, a cool uh, benchmark that somebody did where they actually for, they showed four hardware transcodes on one of these boards. Uh, they do support X264 transcoding, not X265 transcoding, but they do have X265 decoding, so you could still potentially get some performance benefit from using this board. And it is supported by the Kubernetes Intel GPU plugin. And it's supported as in parentheses. We'll get into that in a minute. So this met all my criteria. And when I started off, I drew this out of what I wanted to do. I had a Raspberry Pi 3 as my master node. Of course, this and, and running my, my, uh, my NAS. And of course, this actually didn't work well because it's USB 2. Terrible idea, very bad read write speeds. So I upgraded that to a Pi 4 for my master node. 
And then um, I had originally planned to throw a relay into here so I could switch nodes on and off using the uh, Raspberry Pi's uh, I.O. Um, but uh, I haven't needed to do that. And um, even though like auto scaling, that would be really cool to get to. Maybe that's something I'll do in the future. And then it's all sitting on a gigabit switch. And there's, a, I think it's a 200 watt power supply supplying power to my, um, my four atomic Pi nodes. So uh, that's, that's, that's the basic setup. This is what I started with, and I'll show you in a second what I've built. Um, as far as setup goes, it's pretty straightforward. I basically installed Ubuntu 18.04 server, threw a static IP on there. Uh, I did need to install an NFS package, which I forgot to mention, just so that um, my pods could actually access NFS services. Uh, and then I installed K3s. And if you don't know K3s, and some people call it K3s, just like it's K8s or, or K8s or whatever, but K3s uh, is brilliant. I mean, we're talking about Kubernetes in 40 megs. It's super, super small, super slim, super efficient. It supports both ARM and x86. And I am going to have a mixed cluster because I have my ARM master node as well as my Atomic Pi uh, uh, worker nodes. And then there is basically no step three. The, the installation for K3s is super simple. You're looking at the whole thing right there. So getting these set up, uh, even doing it manually was actually really, really quick and easy. And the nodes are basically blank. Uh, there's nothing really special about them. Um, I could lose one tomorrow and I'm not gonna worry about it. I can add another one in and it's gonna be super easy to provision. Um, as far as the networking goes, this is a home network and I don't have a managed switch. I don't have something fancy going on. I basically have, I do have Google Fiber, which is fancy, but uh, basically on my router, all I did is I reserved 100 addresses um, in my DHCP so that uh, I could give that to the cluster to actually manage. Um, the K3's cluster actually has onboard networking that's included. I don't know if it's Calico or what it is under the hood, but it just works and I haven't had to mess with it. So that's great. <laughs> uh, and then I did install Metal LB, a Metal Load Balancer, which is a, a Kubernetes project. I think it's in the CNCF. It's pretty rad and uh, basically gave it around 40 addresses that it could allocate to ingress or service load balancers or whatever it needs. And um, so this, this setup from a networking perspective was pretty easy. When I first did this, I actually was doing it with a, uh, a, a wireless network bridge in between, which was a whole other load of malarkey. Uh, but now I've, I've reworked all my networking in my house. So I have everything just connected through a switch up into my, uh, up into my router. And, and so it's actually very simple networking. It's nothing that's uh, super fancy that, you know, that requires any brilliance on my part, um, which is good because I don't have a whole lot. Uh, so I want to show you really quick how the server looks. And for that, I'm going to switch my view to the atomic view. This is the live view of the cluster. Let me get up and look over here and I'll point out some stuff. You can see all my nodes here, node one, two, three, and four. And then for scale, of course, you do have the Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is my uh, master node or my primary node that's actually running the, the main part of the cluster. Hopefully I didn't crash it just by touching it. Uh, and then you can see I've actually um, uh, spliced out the networking cables so they all fit nicely and they all go up into a switch that's just sitting above it. And back here, we've got our power supply, which runs this whole length. The, the power supply is, is actually as big as probably two nodes. And then I do have a, a USB 3 drive sitting in here in the cluster. I'm actually not using this for storage anymore uh, for some reasons that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it did fit in here nicely with the Legos. And eventually, I'd like to put this into maybe a rack or something. But I still consider this kind of a, a work in progress. So I'm not quite ready to, to get um, you know, fancy with the storage yet. So that's the Atomic Pi, uh, and uh, it's uh, the Atomic Cluster, in other words. Uh, and so far, it's working pretty great. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the setup, and then I'll get into a little bit more demo action here in a second. First of all, K3 is actually comes with a system upgrade controller for Kubernetes, which is bloody brilliant, because otherwise, I would have to figure out how to keep these things updated with the latest version of Kubernetes. In this case, I can actually create a plan, and you can see the plan up here Basically, I specify for my master node how many concurrency can I change so I can actually do HA uh, K3s here. Uh, and then for my worker nodes, how many concurrency updates can I run? And basically, I just took the boilerplate here, stuck in the version I wanted right there, and applied it, and it upgraded all my nodes for me. So this is actually super friendly with CICD. I actually have it hooked up to both Argo and Codefresh for my, my DevOps kind of reducing toil project. 
Um, so this is super slick, great, keeps my Kubernetes nodes updated, and uh, it works both for ARM and for x86 because again, I have a Raspberry Pi for my master node and all my worker nodes are x86. So as what basically the way this works is uh, Argo does the sync. So, so CodeFresh can do some testing, but Argo does the sync uh, that actually uh, sends the uh, plan to the system upgrade controller. Basically, it sends it to Kubernetes, records these CRD plans, um, and then the upgrade controller actually takes the work to make sure that those are applied. And it, it will migrate itself to another node if it needs to, I believe, so that it doesn't uh, you know, have any issues when it's upgrading nodes. And I found that this works really well. It doesn't take a node offline um, until it's ready to upgrade it. So the first time I tried to do it, I actually had selected like a, the wrong tag or something for my version. And it, uh, it just said, oh, well, I can't upgrade this with this current, this current plan. So I didn't have any downtime. I didn't lose the node or anything. Uh, so this thing's brilliant. And I basically just make a, uh, make a change to the version, do a git commit and push, and then it automatically rolls out through Argo, which I'll show you in a second. Um, there's the Intel Quick Sync device plugin for Kubernetes, uh, which I also installed, and this is designed to support OpenCL, which is not supported by the Atomic Pi, but we only need the VA API, which is supported by this plugin. Uh, so installing this exposes the onboard GPU for hardware, hardware transcoding, and um, uh, I, the only thing, I actually did make a pull request to this thing that they accepted, which was to make it so that it didn't try to roll out to ARM nodes. So uh, I think Intel was more than happy to get rid of that. And then in Kubernetes, let me see if I can move out of the way a little bit. This is uh, basically all you need to add to your Kubernetes pods once you've installed this. You just make a resource limit and request the uh, GPU Intel, and then it will only deploy those pods um, onto nodes that are capable of doing hardware transcoding. And uh, this was actually pretty slick. Uh, works really well. Um, I also mentioned that I have GitOps running here. So I have the CodeFresh runner installed. Uh, the CodeFresh runner is basically an on-prem component that you can throw onto a cluster. It can run builds. It can access your cluster behind the firewall. I haven't opened up any of my ports from my home network to, co to CodeFresh or anything like that. But it, all, it basically sits on my cluster. Everything stays private to my cluster, but I can manage it from the CodeFresh UI. So no matter where I am, I can actually run builds against the cluster or anything like that. Um, and they happen automatically. So I can actually execute both pipelines and access resources um, behind the firewall. Well, not, not necessarily access resources behind the firewall, but that's a whole other ball of wax. But uh, it works really well, uh, and it's very scalable. So as I add more nodes, I can run more builds. Um, I also have Argo CD used for sync. So once I'm ready to make a deployment, I do a git commit and push. In some cases, that triggers a code fresh flow that actually does builds and tests before triggering a deployment. And in other cases, it just, uh, it just goes directly to Argo CD to just sync onto the cluster. Um, and you can follow my project at github.com slash today was awesome slash atomic cluster. So you can actually see how I've got uh, most of this stuff set up. And I have a little bit of a write up and I'll add a shopping list before this airs. Um, so that you can actually see all the components in my board. Now, storage. I mentioned we were going to talk about this earlier. Storage in Kubernetes, everybody knows, is a bit rough. And I have to say, it is a bit rough. <laughs> uh, it's tough. So I ended up going with a separate NAS for NF uh, to, to do my networking to provide my storage. Um, and it's serving it over NFS. The reason that I didn't keep it on my atomic, uh, sorry, on my Raspberry Pi is that uh, that USB drive just goes dormant sometimes. And so as service, I try to access a service and it would take a long time to basically warm up the USB, mount it, remount it, um, get it provided over the network. And by the time that that's happened, you know, maybe you have a pod failing, things aren't working well. It was just slow and clunky and, and, and didn't work super well. It worked fine for the proof of concept, but not a good long-term solution. So I moved this over to a dedicated NFS which is uh, probably the background fan whir that you hear. Um, and uh, it's a little noisy, so I'd like to do something else there. But in this case, it's basically running a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of hard drives that have a ton of storage on them. And the NFS is very, very fast. So this does work better, but a lot of these services were not designed to work in a Kubernetes environment. And so I've noticed that they do sometimes get a little finicky. Um, I'm looking into uh, Rook as a storage provider, which supports Ceph. 
uh, which is a distributed file system. I think that's really interesting, but I probably need to do some different things with my cluster before I can have uh, distributed storage working on it. Because right now my, my nodes are all throwaway, right? They're not special. But once I start to throw storage on there, I now have to be thinking about redundancy and how that works. So I think that's very promising and might work really well for just the kind of config data portions of what I'm doing. Maybe the Plex configuration, that kind of thing that is more expectant of running on a local file system. A lot of these services use SQLite, which works great when it's sitting on a desktop. But boy, howdy, it does not like running off of a network file storage. So I have had to repair a number of SQLite databases while I've been using this. Uh, maybe a pod goes down before uh, the lock is removed from the database, something like that. Um, I actually did use lose data several times, which is, this is a good exercise, right? This is what home labs are for. Uh, so that's been a big learning experience for me. Um, and looking into the future, I am planning on getting some 10 gig uh, uh, networking going where my NA, my NAS, I'd actually like to have um, a 10 gig uh, ethernet connection to that, that I then distribute to all my one gigabit a second nodes. And that way I could have very high read write uh, throughput. And, and 10 gig isn't necessarily super expensive. You can actually find cards for uh, PCs for like 20, 30 bucks. Um, the switches are a little bit more tricky. You can find switches that aren't too pricey that have 10 gig copper ethernet connections and if you can actually use a regular cable if you're going over a very short distance uh, but they are very pricey once you get into the 24 port, port uh, range but now I'm talking more home networking stuff so anyway that's that's more future thinking but storage does remain a little bit of a problem I can use my cluster today it does work but I am a, I notice the storage is a little bit finicky so I have to watch it um, so I'm gonna that's something I'm gonna have to invest a little bit more time into to fixing and addressing um, there, once you start doing this, you will find there are a ton of community maintained images on linuxserver.io. Uh, so they have everything from home lab, uh, basically all your home lab stuff. Um, and they are pretty nice images. They usually include things like user permissions mapping, which is important when you're using a, 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 um, your, your storage. You want to be able to put the, the right permissions mask on it. Um, but they were really all designed for working with Docker Compose on a local machine. And actually, when I showed this setup to a friend of mine, he said, hey, these are really cool. This is really cool that you're running all these services, but I do all this on my desktop, and I just do Docker Compose up. And it seems like you've done a lot more work than that to get all this Kubernetes working, to which I would say, yes, yes, I have. Yes, I've done a lot more work than that. But I have something modular and scalable, so it's, and, and, and actually cheaper than what, uh, what uh, he's, he's designed and built. So um, you know, I'm happy with the choice in that case. Uh, th so check these images out. They have pretty good maintenance and upgrades. Um, I'm going to jump into another demo here. Let's actually just browse around the cluster and I'll show you a few things of note here. So I'm actually sitting inside my Git repo here. I have some uncommitted changes. So if I commit those, it'll actually trigger a sync to the cluster. But before I do that, I want to show you um, some interesting things. Uh, when I'm looking at my services, you'll notice that I actually have two Plex services here. One is for UDP and one is for not UDP. It's for TCP. I have the same thing going with NetBoot XYZ, which is a um, which is a, uh, a a NetBoot provider, so you can boot machines up over over uh, your LAN network. Um, the reason I have to have two is because Kubernetes load balancers do not support both UDP and TCP at the same time. So what we've done is these actually use and uh, let me let me resize this window slightly so you can see. Hang on, let me, let me bring it down just a little bit. Just a little bit. So you can see a little bit more what's going on here. There we go. So uh, you'll actually notice that those load balancers for the same service actually share IP. So to see this NetBoot one actually has tw uh, is, is 1025 and the other one above it is 1025. So this is actually a feature of Metal Load Balancer where you can actually put annotations on a service to tell it that you can actually share an IP address. So this was a little bit of a gotcha to figure out how to serve UDP and TCP. And this is important for a couple of services. For NetBoot, it's important um, just because of the way NetBoot works and it has to have a TFTP server that, that uh, th things can access, which works over UDP. Plex was the one that was a surprise to me. Everywhere I looked, people just had Plex images that were serving up TCP. And uh, a lot of local devices don't work well if you don't have UDP. So if I've got like a Roku TV, it couldn't see Plex 
most of the time. It couldn't see it reliably until I added the UDP load balancer and advertised um, those services. And of course, I have to keep it on the same IP address. Otherwise, I think the whole thing would get confused and, and funky. So that's something to watch out for. You do have to care about um, UDP and TCP. And again, this goes towards the home lab. The truth is most stuff is not designed to work with the home lab. Um, the other thing that I ran into uh, and learned uh, very quickly is, of course, and, and most people know this, I think, if you're seasoned, but um, all of my, uh, my volumes and volume claims are actually immutable. So when I'm working with these things, if I make a change, they won't automatically get configured. It'll basically throw an error and say, hey, I can't, I can't deploy that. Um, so today I was rolling out a new change, uh, which went through Argo CD um, and CodeFresh, uh, and it couldn't complete the rollout because one of the PVCs was different, and I actually had to go and delete the PVC. And the, the only issue with that, and again, let me resize my window here, is for some reason, and this is something else that I, I probably need to look into, um, I typically run into issues when I'm trying to delete these PVCs because they basically have some protection on them. Uh, so if I look at these PVCs, let's say that uh, I wanted to delete this Minecraft Dir one. Um, it probably won't delete when I try to delete it. So yeah, it says it's deleted, but it's hanging. And it's hanging because there are finalizers on it, which is, a, I think it's just a feature built into Kubernetes. So if I pull this open again, it will say that it's terminating and that thing will sit there forever. It will never die. And so you actually have to do something a little gross. And this is all like pretty, like, I'm not telling you to ever do this with production. <laughs> Obviously, I'm like, I'm like just, I'm the only user here, right? So it's, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm violating some principles here. But basically, the only way I've figured out how to get these to actually delete is to go in and remove this protection finalizer. And once I do that, this thing will delete right away. Uh, and so you can see that it's been edited. And if I get PVC, it'll be gone. So I just killed my Minecraft uh, instance. Not a big deal, because I'll just reapply the config. Um, or uh, I can actually just do it through Argo. And that'll just work smoothly. There'll be no problems there. Um, so this, this actually, you can see, you know, just looking around my cluster here for a second, um, you can see I've got a number of different namespaces here. I've got the Argo CD namespace. I have a system upgrade namespace, which is where that system upgrade controller is working. And if we look at that, uh, let's get, um, yeah, just, just that. Uh, you can see that we actually just have a single pod there running for the controller. And then if I look in the Argo, um, what you'll be able to see is that I have all my Argo stuff running, and then I also have a CF Argo CD agent. And basically what that does is it sits between uh, CodeFresh and Argo and keeps all the information up to date in CodeFresh so that all my build information is annotated and associated with what deployments and rollouts are happening, which is a really useful view to have. Um, I'm not gonna get super deep into that demo, but if you wanna check it out, go to codefresh.io, we'll have some videos up there. Um, so that's pretty slick. And then, uh, of course, I actually run a lot of stuff out of my default namespace. I know it's a little silly. I've got my ingress in there and all that kind of stuff. So works pretty smoothly. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and overall, I'd have to say that this, this whole setup runs fairly smoothly and uh, is pretty rad. So I'm gonna go back over here for a second. Um, now I'm happy to take questions and uh, you can follow progress at github.com slash today was awesome slash atomic cluster. I wanted to show you just for a second um, over here in my, let's actually look at the Argo dashboard here. So here you can see actually the, the different uh, services that I have set up with Argo and you can, sh you can see it, they're all synced. Um, and if I go over to CodeFresh, I'll actually get the same view. My browser crashed because uh, I've got OBS running and it, it just tanks all of my processor power. Um, oh man, not loading, come on. There we go. Uh, so, so this view actually will give me all the information. Now, like I mentioned in the future, I think I need to solve the storage issues. Um, and I also wanted to set up automated node provisioning using Ansible so that when I plug in a node, these, actually, these nodes actually have PXE boot enabled by default. So they will actually, um, they will actually automatically 
uh, boot to the um, NetBoot server and install something. Now, one of the things that I actually looked into was uh, there is a way to set up these nodes so that they boot an image and just run that. So you don't actually install anything on the node. It just runs the image from the network. And um, I actually ruled that out because I lose power sometimes and I want to have cold start easy and I don't want to have some separate services or anything. I actually want to run everything on my Kubernetes cluster. Anything that's sitting outside of the Kubernetes cluster besides the NFS, um, and even that is a little bit suspect. Uh, anything that's running outside of the Kubernetes cluster is another point of failure that I have to maintain. And I don't want to have to maintain it. So yeah, you can see here that in CodeFresh, I've got all these apps uh, sitting here as well. And if I look at, um, uh, let's see, which one would, would be interesting? So this one actually has a couple failures on it because I had to delete uh, my PVC because it wasn't able to sync. So that was the, the issue that I was talking about earlier. But it is in sync right now, so everything's fine. Um, in this view, actually, uh, this one doesn't have builds associated with it, but if it did, I would actually see the build information here. And of course, my pull requests, any issues in Jira that I would have created, which again, I'm not doing because clearly this is overkill for my home cluster, but it, it's just kind of rad to be able to use the, uh, the clean DevOps stuff. So with that, I want to thank you for coming to my KubeCon talk. I hope that this was interesting. Maybe it'll inspire you to build your own Kubernetes cluster, your own home lab, your own atomic cluster, and uh, hopefully it works really well. I was really happy with mine. Like I said, check out the repo. I will throw um, a shopping list in there. I think this whole build, uh, what did I spend? I spent 140 bucks on, 40 bucks on Atomic Pies because I have four of them. I spent 30 bucks on the Raspberry Pi and then I spent maybe 20 bucks on the other things. So we're talking about sub $200 for this Kubernetes cluster. And let me tell you what, for a PC that I could buy for 200 bucks, there's no way it would come close to the amount of power and uh, scalability I get out of this thing. So like I mentioned, I run Plex on this thing. I got a Minecraft server. I got a couple other things that I'm running on it. I'm going to be adding more as I go along. And I'm not worried about running out of space or storage because I can always throw another node in. And uh, so I have this scalable Kubernetes cluster. It's running great. Uh, and I'm pretty happy with it. So feel free to ask me questions on Twitter at Today Was Awesome. And of course, if you're watching this at KubeCon Live, I will be hanging out in the chat and uh, having conversation there. So look forward to hearing your questions. And thanks again. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was interesting. Uh, I don't know if you feel like it was the ultimate cluster. Let me know if you feel like this was the ultimate <laughs> Kubernetes home lab, or if you feel like uh, maybe it's a little too far on the cheap side. Maybe you're looking for something a little bit more beefy, but at least it's accessible. All right. Have a good one. Thank you.